Yeah. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Bonjour. Hello. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> Another fall. Bonjour. Bonjour. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm super, super excited to be here today. Uh, and I'm really, really thankful for being asked to be a host of, of this really uh, interesting topic to talk about today. My name is Gene Cleckley. I'm one of the career coaches uh, here in INSEAD, here on the Fontainebleau campus. I'm very, very, very honored today to be able to, to listen to this presentation and to meet Pierre. Um, I'm going to introduce Pierre. Today we're going to do a presentation and you feel free to ask questions during the presentation. Pierre will uh, allow time for that. And then at the end, we'll have another Q&A as well. So that's how all this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to introduce Pierre. Pierre Chandon is a L'Oreal Chair Professor of Marketing, Innovation and Creativity and the Director of the INSEAD Sorbonne University Behavioral Lab. Very interesting. Pierre studies how food marketing is making people fat and what firms and consumers should do about it. Okay? He's also teaching a course on this topic to the MBAs currently. And the name of the course is called The Body Business, Understanding Food and Well-Being. So I'm really, really happy, really, really interested to hear this. And let's welcome Pierre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here with you. Also, because I know that a lot of new students, so it's a great opportunity to be able to uh, talk to you about what's really my passion, which is uh, food marketing you know, and food in general. You know, I'm half French, half Italian, you know, what do you expect? And so uh, <laughs> what I wanted to do is, uh, so is, first of all, warning, okay? I've been working on this for more than 15 years. I have tons of stuff I love to share. So if you don't interrupt me, it'll just be me talking, which is not what we want. Uh, we want everyone to ask questions, including on the Zoom, we have the chat here, so please go ahead. And um, also, I wanted to tell you that uh, I will today give you like a brief introduction to um, what I do when I'm not teaching. I mean, I know it's a mystery for many students. What do these professors do when they're not teaching? Uh, and, uh, and, and Jean mentioned the INSEAD Sorbonne Behavioral Lab, which is uh, the lab that I direct, which is where we actually conduct studies. In fact, 90% of the results I will show you today come from the studies that we conduct here at INSEAD because that's what we do. We're researchers. And also it's a way to, uh, I think, uh, increase the INSEAD brand and also for all of us, hopefully as marketers, but also as uh, humans, as parents, as consumers, to understand a bit better about how we're influenced by marketing where we make our choices. So you'll see today a lot of studies that we run in the lab in Paris. Uh, where you know you actually are welcome to come as a participant, earn some money to help in CIAD research. So um, the topic of my, my talk is uh, aligning health, business, and eating pleasure with Epicurean food marketing. So I actually have the, the, this uh, head of Epicurus, uh, the famous uh, Greek philosopher in my office. I didn't bring it today. But uh, you'll see that a lot of what I really want to say is not new in the sense that Epicurus himself uh, told it to his uh, famous uh, friend Minisius in the letter to Minisius. And, and the, really the idea is the following. I will show you how there is a new model for food companies to continue to grow without growing our bellies. A model that recognizes that pleasure is not the enemy of health, but can actually be the ally of healthy eating. And so because I have a lot of uh, data and information I want to show you. So here's really, again, uh, the gist of it, okay? And you'll see this exactly the same as the last time. Today, we're, uh, the food industry is uh, at a crossroad. And I've been telling all the CEOs that I meet, uh, whether they're retailers or manufacturers, that today, they say they're in the food industry. But in reality, they behave as if they were in the energy business, oil and gas. Because their business model today is to grow by selling more calories. So calories are energy. More calories to more people, more often for more money. And the problem, of course, with this model is today, the externalities in terms of health and well-being are just um, totally contradicting this business model. Today, we are forced to choose between taste and health, between food and health. This is a, a really incredible poster that was actually uh, designed by the New York City of Health under Bloomberg, they were really at the forefront of the fight against obesity. And it said portions have grown, and so has type 2 diabetes, which can lead to amputation. 
So he said, cut your portions, cut your risk, or we may have to cut your leg. There will be so much to say about this, okay? Uh, the fear appeal, does it work, etc. But one thing we know for sure is that no restaurant owners will voluntarily put that in the restaurants. Imagine that drive through in the fast food restaurant, hey, would you like to supersize your portion? And at some point we'll have to downsize your leg. You know, clearly this is not something the food industry wants. And I think this is where we are today. This clash between health, public health, NGOs, consumer advocates, and the food industry. And one solution, it's not an easy one, but uh, is, uh, is really to go back to what Epicure said. Because Epicure said, this is really important. He said, the wise person does not choose the largest amount of food, but the most pleasing. And so the idea is to move from selling more food to selling more pleasure. Growing from not more calories, but less food and more pleasure. And um, so this is uh, uh, the, the idea. And so what I want to do is I will share with you, uh, first of all, uh, some background data about why this is a big problem today and the obesity pandemic. Number two, I'll show you how the food industry and governments are typically responding to that, which is basically informing people, calorie labeling and reformulation. And then I'll show you how Epicurean food marketing, which is what I've studied here, uh, offer an alternative view uh, to uh, achieve what Epicurus uh, was hoping we would do. All right, so first, the obesity epidemic. So just to uh, warm everything else, um, which parts of the world have the highest obesity rates today? Yes? Probably the more wealthy parts, so at least the US. No, no? that's what's interesting, yes? Uh, Dubai. Dubai is not, by, is not far, but it's not number one. Dubai? No, it's Sorry. number three, yes. <laughs> US, no, otherwise that would be too easy, yes? Mexico? Uh, close, US, Mexico, but no. Yes, Alex? Or something like that. Brazil, Brazil or something like that. Oh, Brazil? 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 No, no, no. no. Yes? Is somewhere like Pacific Islander? Pacific Island, absolutely. So the Cook Islands, um, the Samoa, American Samoa, has the highest obesity rate in the world. You know, for many reasons, but you first, you know, you see genetically, you've seen the Samoa rugby players, they're really big, okay? You add onto that Western diet, and you have in those islands, Nauru, et cetera, more than 70 to 80% of the population that's obese, not just overweight, okay? Uh, so we have uh, first uh, Pacific Islands, mentioning Dubai, uh, the Gulf Coast area, the GCC uh, region, uh, Kuwait, Saudi, et cetera. Uh, North America from US to Mexico is only number three, so to speak. And then the Levant, so from Turkey to Egypt. So what you see here in this chart is, uh, you have countries with more than 25% obesity on every single continent. So it's not just a rich world country. In fact, it's a becoming more and more a developing countries problem. Uh, and um, the thing that's important to realize, and I'm going really super fast here, is that people are gaining weight on average. You know, the average population is gaining weight. It's not that there are just some people who are just for some bizarre reasons gaining a lot of weight. It's not that they want to. You know, uh, something like 70% of Americans have tried at least once in their life to lose weight and failed, okay? And it's, uh, it's um, uh, the increase in obesity uh, in weight is something that's very easy to get. You know, ask you know, anyone, just look around, uh, just 100, 100 extra calories a day per day is one pound at the end of the year. After that, it levels off because as you become bigger, your metabolism requires more calories. So you won't go grow to infinity, obviously. Uh, and the thing to, to understand is, it's okay. I am myself totally okay with it, especially that now I am at the, in the overweight category. Because if you have a BMI above 25, you're officially overweight. And uh, which uh, suddenly I find it's actually totally fine. And it is totally fine. You know, maybe your vanity, maybe uh, your, your bitch body is not the one it used to be. But uh, the point to understand is that it's not being overweight that's a problem, it's being really obese and especially morbidly obese. So BMI above 35. And what you have here is the risk uh, impact of obesity. And you can see it's highly nonlinear. But if you're obese, then things are not looking good. Being obese increases the risk of diabetes by nine times, hypertension by three, heart attacks, some kinds of cancer. And here's the, the really crazy and, and very sad uh, statistics that obese children 
are twice more likely to die before reaching the age of 55 compared to those with normal weight. Wow. So there are serious consequences to obesity uh, if you're really severely obese. But even if you're not, I think there are also wellness and self-perception and self-esteem consequences. Now, when we were all thin and starving, we used to worship fat. Now we're all fat and wealthy, we worship thin. And so what's interesting from also a marketing point of view and a wellness point of view, it's becoming more and more difficult to be big. And um, if, you know, as the proud father of three daughters, I mean, you know, the, um, it's not just girls, of course, but, you know, we know that society does not reward being overweight. And um, here's the statistics that I find the most uh, crazy in that. They did this study in the UK where they showed uh, English teachers the same essay. And they either told the teacher that, uh, actually they showed the photos of the students who were supposed to have written the essay. And one photo showed an overweight kid, the other one showed a kid with a normal weight. And the same essay received a 10% lower grade when the teachers thought that it had been written by an overweight, obese kid. And when asked to grade the essay, the teacher said that the kid did not apply himself or you know, that it was sloppy and lazy and all the, you know, the usual, uh, I think, uh, uh, characteristics we associate with obesity. So even if the teachers were supposed to really be there for the students are discriminating against those who are, who are big. Um, like I said, I, 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 you know, as a proud father of three daughters, I became a world expert. I never thought I would say that one day, but I became a world expert in Disney princesses. <laughs> and so I can still ask me anything. Uh, and we know they come from all walks of lives, from all hair and skin color, etc. But they have one thing in common. They are all extremely thin, all of them. And in popular culture, the big fat people are either the villain or maybe the sidekick but you know, never the heroes. And uh, you know, uh, the self-image uh, translates also into lower employment opportunities. You know, people discriminate against uh, people who are big, especially women. There are a few obese CEOs. There are hardly any who are men. There are hardly any female obese CEO or politician or whatever, okay? So, I mean, there really is a strong stigma uh, even beyond the health consequences, okay? Uh, social interactions uh, and uh, doctors, etc. So my daughters just did an internship at the Miller Hospital during the COVID crisis. And, you know, as we all know, obesity is one of, is the strongest with age aggravating factor for COVID. But, you know, what you told me about how the nurses and the doctors treat their obese patients um, is, is really is sad. In a sense, many doctors say that if you're obese and you're in the hospital, it's your fault. And you know you don't want to be in that case when the people who are supposed to look after you uh, think it's your fault. Okay. Um, so he, the study here, 50% of physicians in anonymous surveys, they view their obese patients as you know, non-compliant, but also just plain ugly. So this is just to say that the societal co uh, cost of being overweight and is, is, is really large. And uh, it affects uh, people who are, did nothing wrong. I think this is really important because it's, it's a bit like what happened with tobacco. When people die because they smoke, people are like, you know, that's your choice. But secondhand smoking is what really totally turned the, 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 the discourse because it said, look, you are killing people who had nothing to do with it. And with obesity, it's not the same, but it's also somewhat similar. Because we know, for example, that the single largest predictor of obesity is whether your mother was obese when she was carrying you uh, uh, in her. Uh. And so children of obese uh, parents are more likely to be obese for no reasons of their own, for reasons that are actually poorly understood. Uh, but somehow the, the body thinks, you know, something is, uh, the, the body, the, the child, child's body accumulates a lot of of, uh, of fat if the mother was fat. Uh, it affects others, so it is contagious. Uh, we know that uh, the chances of becoming obese are much more likely if you have more obese friends. And it also influences our friends, the, the cats and dogs. So I thought no presentation these days should be without a cat and a dog. And so I thought just for fun, <laughs> there's an obesity epidemic again among cats and dogs also in the rich world. 
And I know it really well because you know this really cute dog, cat here is, is mine. <laughs> His name is Shoops. And it's interesting because we never consider him to be fat, just fluffy. And then a friend of ours came to the house and said, oh, but your cat is so fat. <laughs> Let me tell you, it was painful to hear. I took it really personal. I said, no, he's not fat. He's actually very active, blah, blah, blah. He's big boned. And so it's, it's true. It's, it's funny. And, um, and so I started researching the, 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 what's going on with, with pet obesity. And I found this 50% of American cats and dogs are overweight. And I found another really fun piece of statistics, which I wanted to share with you because I think it's incredible. Uh, there is actually a strong correlation between the weight of the dog, not the cat, and the weight of the owner. I mean, cats are much more independent. They are smarter. I'm team cat here. Okay, But for dogs, if you have a heavy owner, you have a heavy dog. How do you think? Why do you think that happens? Yes. Rationally, the dog would get bigger portions and it would also get less exercise because you have to walk with the dog, but the yes. cat can take care of itself. It can decide the level of exercise that it wants for itself. Limitations it in terms of portions, in terms of, um, of exercise, absolutely. What else? Yes? Absolutely. Preferences, very good, okay. You know, maybe you like a big dog if you're big yourself. And these are two uh, excellent uh, answers. And this is from a, an, an old ad for pet food. You know, there is a thing here, I think, okay? Uh, we can all agree. People like to uh, have dogs that look a bit like them. Um, so the preference explanation is part of it. The imitation explanation, certainly. But there's a third explanation. And that's the one that I found fascinating. When I talked about contagion, it was not just a metaphor. So you're probably aware of uh, all uh, what we call the, the microbiota. So these are these um, um, microbes that actually uh, live on us inside our gut mostly, but also on the skin, in the mouth, and they outnumber our own cells nine to one. So we actually have more foreign cells in our bodies than our own cells with our DNA. And um, what we know is that these, um, this ecosystem matters a lot for obesity. So for example, we know that if you uh, transplant from an uh, obese mouse, uh, the part of the intestinal flora to a sterile mouse, that mouse is going to gain fat. We don't really know why exactly, but we know it matters a lot. We know that, for example, when uh, people undergo uh, gastric bypass to lose weight, the reason why they lose weight is not really that they cannot eat, because you, you could still eat a lot if you eat throughout the day is that it changes the composition of your gut microbes, the microbiome, and that actually changes your preferences. I've done a lot of work with uh, surgeons at the Pitier, uh, Pitier Hospital in Paris, and you know, we find people who were obsessed with food, who couldn't even taste the taste of um, sweetness because they were so used to it. After bypass, they become totally uninterested in food and their taste acuity rises to the roof. So, now, what's going on with pets is that these studies found that people who have dogs, they share more skin bacteria with their dogs than with their own children because of all the smooching of the dog and going around. So one of the reasons why the dogs are becoming obese is probably because they uh, get some of the uh, microbiota from their owners, which influences their preferences and their metabolism. So think about it next time you, you know, you're kissing your dog. Or your, or your children or your parents. You know, there is weird stuff going on. So following, finishing the parenthesis, um, we know that we're getting obese. We know that uh, it influences others. And now why are we all gaining weight? Of course, it's a really big question. And of course, it's a question of balance between calorie expenditure and calorie intake, um, because that's the law of thermodynamics. Calorie expenditures, Yes, you know, you cannot deny that it can have an impact. Uh, I love this photo. You maybe have seen it around on the internet. Uh, you see those young, healthy guys that are taking the escalator instead of the stairs. And it's really ironic when you know where they're going, which is to, to the gym, okay? And so uh, there is really something to be said for a basic economics explanation of obesity. It's, a, it's as simple as that. In the old days, calories were good, now they're bad. 
Calories were good because we were paid to burn calories through our manual work. I'm working manually, you know, I need calories, I need energy because that will give me money. Now calories are bad because instead of being paid to burn them, we pay by going to the gym to burn them. And they're super cheap also. In the old days, calories were really expensive because you had to kill your own food, okay? Now it's impossible to walk a few meters without seeing cheap calories. So calories are cheap and we pay to burn them. So not surprisingly, you know, we acquire more of them and we expand and we burn fewer. So that I think is, is, very, is very true, okay? However, it cannot really explain the story. First of all, uh, if you look at the amount of exercise of the last 20 years, it's actually gone up. People are exercising more today than they used 20 years ago. So it cannot explain why obesity has gone up. Uh, also, we know that um, exercising is fantastic. It's the best remedy in addition to sleep. Remember that, okay? But it's not a great way to actually lose weight. Uh, you have to go up and down the Eiffel Towers many times before you actually uh, lose weight. I mean, if you, if you run for 10 minutes on the treadmill, it will tell you you lost 100 calories. What it doesn't tell you is that by doing nothing, like by sitting now listening to me, you would have burned half those calories. Because the 2,000 calories a day is what your metabolism requires just to get your brain going. And so actually, it doesn't make such a huge deal. If you want to explain why people are, uh, are gaining more, uh, weight, it's because of the supply and the intake of calories. To make a really complex story super simple, as a species, okay, uh, we uh, are 200,000 years old, okay, homo sapiens. And since we existed, even before we existed, if you look, for example, at, uh, at liquids, uh, beverages, uh, the only thing we could drink was water, okay, infant milk, okay, um, as, as an infant. However, since these, those years, we as a species have developed those delicious, fantastic ways to get calories to beverages, starting with wine and then beer and tea and then liquor and Coca-Cola and Red Bull and whatnot, okay? So in a way, uh, the environment has changed. Our bodies have not. And we have never been, uh, I think, uh, um, the evolution has never favored the ability to uh, detect calories in beverages because we never had to worry about it because oh, the only thing we could drink was water. Nowadays, of course, it's just the opposite. And so in that sense, I like the definition of obesity as a normal response to an abnormal environment. We have an abnormal environment where calories are cheap and plentiful. And where burning calories is expensive. So guess what? We're gaining weight. All right, so this is really uh, the, uh, the, the, what's going on. And what's, because we're in a business school, you know, we wonder what impact does it have on the food industry? And the impact is, of course, big. It's not something that's totally new, by the way. Um, some of you may know this famous quote, sugar, rum, and tobacco are extremely proper subjects of taxation. Who said that? is on a 20, dollar, a 20 um, pound banknote. Adam Smith, the father of you know, a free market economy. Uh, and so why did he say that? He's not ex exactly uh, a socialist, right? But his idea was that tobacco, sugar, and um, alcohol are universally loved, true, and they're not necessary for survival, true as well. In fact, before the Crusades, the Western world didn't know about sugar. The only way people could get sugar was through honey. And when they brought the sugar canes from the Middle East, they, they called it liquid honey. They, they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and nowadays there's sugar everywhere and we, we, and we love it, but we don't need sugar to survive. And so um, for these reasons, governments have started to tax, especially sugar, but not just, uh, seen, seen taxes on food, and they work. Not only do they work, as you can see here, the impact in Mexico, there's a huge change in the consumption of bottled water versus sodas after the tax on soda was implemented. But also, unlike all the other um, solutions to obesity, they bring money to the government. So guess what? They're super popular. 
and uh, governments around the world, but especially it's interesting in developing countries have really raised the pressure on the food industry. It's interesting because you, usually you would expect maybe this to be a rich world's problem, but the solution come mostly from the developing world. Chile had this really badass health minister uh, that implemented those black octagons that you've seen in South America, not just in Chile, but now they're in Peru and Bolivia and Mexico. That basically when you buy uh, a snack, it's covered in these black dots that say, don't buy. High in fat, high in sugar, high in salt, everywhere. And they also banned television advertising for food from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. I was at a conference in Cambridge before the pandemic with a bunch of public health colleagues. The discussion was not, should we tax food? They've settled that five, five to 10 years ago. It was not even, should we uh, promote the uh, white package the same way it is done for tobacco? They were moving beyond that. They said, should we on this white package actually show the results, the consequences of your eating? In other words, disgusting teeth and big fat bellies, just like we're doing in tobacco. So I think we know the, it's hard for people in the food industry or outside to realize the, the gap between uh, what, how most people see food as something fun and nice to have, nice to eat and drink, and how public health experts in the world see it as the new tobacco. And uh, just to give you one example of how the uh, political uh, context has changed, Boris Johnson. I love this photo because you can see him with this this big sausage. And he says he was insanely proud, not just proud, insanely proud to have a sausage named after him. Well, guess what? When he almost died of COVID because of his obesity, he became uh, now an evangelizer, uh, at least for a while, for uh, health. And uh, he, um, you can see there are videos of him running with his dog and he's really funny as usual. He says, you know, the great thing about running with your dog in the morning is that after that, everything would seem so great during the day. Okay. So he's just pushing it, pushing it. And so, and I was part of a, of a meeting at 10 Downing Street where they were asking us, what should we be doing to reduce the obesity rates in the UK? And that's really was shocking because coming from someone who was totally laissez-faire, you can see a change. So a big problem, big pressure, what should we do? The traditional response is to view healthy eating as a <laughs> knowing problem. We'll just tell people what's healthy, what's not, and then they will eat better. And so the traditional response is nutrition labeling. Nutrition labeling as a way to change demand and also supply. Um, I call all of these cognitive nudges because they're trying to inform you, they talk to your brain about what's healthy and what's not. And I just published a meta-analysis, which is an analysis of analysis. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the result is these are the only interventions, the only nudges that don't work. Uh, if you try to estimate the effect in terms of uh, uh, reduction in uh, calorie intake per day, um, on average, you can expect on a good day, 50 fewer calories a day, which is five sugar cubes, which is not statistically different from zero. If you just describe the nutritional content of the food. If you move from description to prescription with a traffic light, which says buy, don't buy, then you can double the effect, but it's still not a really big effect. You also can also try to move around with merchandising, putting the healthy food at eye level, the unhealthy food hidden, uh, in the back of the menu. All of that is, is, is uh, I'm in favor of that, by the way, you know. I think transparency is important. I think helping people who want to is important, but it doesn't really work. I was involved in a really huge study asking, you know, what do we do when we don't teach? It was a 2 million euro study where we implemented in 60 French supermarkets, the Nutri-Score that you now see everywhere, the British multiple traffic lights, a version of it, that has information on uh, not just overall grade, but on fat, sat fat, uh, sugar, and salt, and then two other systems. And uh, it was a really huge study because we wanted to see, does it actually make a difference? And the results were, uh, if you look at um, the products with the high, highest nutritional value in the category, the good products, so to speak, 
they received a 14% boost, which was actually good news, right, from Nutri-Score. But the mid and the low and the products without a label, no effect. So that when you look at the basket of the total shopping cart, we actually found no effect. And this was really disappointing. And it's not just Nutri-Score, it was even worse with the British system. It was really disappointing because in lab studies, or when we ask people, everyone is in favor of Nutri-Score, like 95% of the French are in favor of it. And they say, yes, of course, as soon as I know what's good for me, I will change my behavior, but they don't. You know what? Here's the truth. And this is something that we often forget. Health does not matter when people make food decisions. People don't choose their food based on health. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you today. There's just a fraction of the people who care about nutrition. And who are these people? People who are already healthy. People who are already <laughs> high income, high education, etc. The truth is, if you really want to change the move the needle on the majority of the people, you need to talk to people who see food as pleasure. Food as you know, something that I can give to my children and they'll be happy and they, they think I'm a good dad, okay? Uh, something that I, I don't want to be bothered with. Uh, and so when people make food choices, they think about, number one, taste, taste, taste. Price, convenience, and nutrition and health, very few people even consider that. So that's why, you know, these um, nudges don't really change how people <laughs> respond. I know there'll be a lot to say and I'm happy if there are a few questions there, um, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, are there any questions from Zoom or anyone in the room? I, I find this really, really interesting. So you were saying that really, that basically health does not matter when people are making their food. Among most people, yes. Uh, and, um, and if you just tell people what's healthy, what's not, first of all, many people will disagree. And because it's true, it, it's very complicated. In nutrition, if you're trying to, uh, find an equation where salt compensates for sat fat, and then people will tell you, oh yes, it's high Nutri-Score, but it's ultra processed, and that's true. You know, so people don't even agree on what it is, but even then, at the end of the day, people already, okay, to, for this to have an effect, first of all, there has to be some news. But the thing is, we already know what's healthy and what's not, more or less. Number two, even if I didn't know it, then I need to be willing to do the right thing. So, for example, I'll take your question in one second because I got started on that. I'm implementing Nutri-Score right now in fast food restaurants, from the pan to chain or like Subway sandwiches. We are concerned that many people, especially men, especially in lower income parts, will see the Nutri-Score and they will do the opposite. They will see like, hey, for the same you know, euro amount, I can have something that's really big and heavy and full of fat because that's what I need. Also, because the green stuff, it's girl food. Sorry, but that's the way many people think, okay? It's, I will be still um, hungry after that, et cetera. So, so, it, so it has, you have to, to learn something and you have to then use that information in the right way. Yes, please. Okay, um, two questions. First, um, is the Nutri-Score um, legally required in France? And no. second, um, I often notice that with beverages, on beer, you sometimes find the calorie yeah. breakdown, but for example, never on wine. And not that I want to know it when I drink it. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I sometimes I'm interested. Yes. In wine, especially like, like no with wine, I've oh, never yes. seen any. Fantastic question. Yes. So Nutri-Score is voluntary. And in fact, uh, the only rule is that if you choose to apply it, then you have to apply it on all of your products. And Guess what? The only ones who use Nutri-Score are those that have, you know, like they're non or healthy or, or the only exception are the private labels. The retailers, by the way, are those that are really changing the world. It's not the manufacturers. If you're Ferrero, there's not so much you can do. If you're Carrefour and you are Auchan and you are Hold the Lays, et cetera, and you're putting Nutri-Score, then you're putting on all of your 7,000 SKUs of your private labels. And then you have D and E, the red ones. By the way, they're not red because the industry didn't like it. They're really dark, dark orange. Yeah, right. You know. Okay. Uh, so it's not compulsory, and there are big fights at the EU level now to make it the recommended system. Italy 
hates this because you know most of their products, but also some people in France rate terrible on Nutri-Score because you know if you take Roquefort cheese, etc., it's D or E, and there's nothing you can do with the recipe. By the way, you know it has to be like that or olive oil, etc. So they're big fights. Uh, and the other question: Why not on alcohol? This is a fascinating question. Alcohol is always regulated separately. Even in the US, you have the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco, which is why for the anecdote, alcohol is metric in the US. It's 75 centiliters, okay, bottles. Everything else is still the old imperial system because it's regulated separately. And alcohol has different rules. And so they don't need to give you eat, not even the basic nutrition information like calories. So you're drinking all of these beers, all this wine or vodka, whatever you guys drink these days, I don't want to know. And you don't realize that, you know, you're getting a lot of calories because guess what? Alcohol, you know, is just sugar. Um, yes. I have a quick question. Thanks, Pierre. Have there been any um, consumer studies while we're talking about uh, nutrition uh, labels? Uh, could studies, if, if you were to organize a, a supermarket, a store, but where the aisles would be organized by category, category A, category B, category C. Have there been any studies showing what consumer studies habits no. are like? No, that's never going to happen because would you like to, to uh, shop in that store? I mean, the thing is, um, everybody agrees that the healthiness should be at the diet level, not at the product level. And I'm a big chocoholic, okay? And I want chocolate, and chocolate is always going to be an E, okay? And so is cheese, etc. So reorganizing the store entirely, um, consumers would rebel. You know, any, any supermarket that's tried this is going out of business in a week, for sure, okay? And number two, it doesn't really, I think, understand that these scores are supposed to be used within one category. That's why it makes no sense to compare Coca-Cola zero and olive oil. Coke zero is B, olive oil is E, because no one is drinking one versus the other. Within the category, for example, we found the strongest effect for prepared foods, so let's say a salad. So a salad has what I call a health halo, because it's like, oh, salad, healthy. Well, guess what? It's full of cheese and crouton and, and oil, et cetera. And so actually inside the salad, there are big differences. So within all the salads that you have in a, in a supermarket, then it makes sense to see that one is a B and one is a C. Uh, but what uh, a whole delays is doing now in Belgium, maybe in the Netherlands, is they are uh, giving you rebates, coupons, based on the nutri score of the product you buy, which I think is very smart because you, you don't want to reorganize the full store, okay, and get people lost and angry, but you want to reward people for within the category choosing what. Yeah, we have one question from Zoom. It's from Denise, and the question is, are people not taking an interest in nutrition now with more people trying to go vegan, veggie, flexitarian, Etc. Or is this more related to concern for the environment in a very small minority? Yes, great question. And so, um, actually, one issue with nutrient score is people think that A, because it's green, means organic. And it doesn't. People tend to see the world of food in two um, separated into. There's good food and bad food. And good food, people think it's food that's local and organic and sustainable and veggie and nutritious. And sometimes it's true that the same food can be all of that. Let's say if it's plant-based and it's local. But in reality, there are, you know, it could be totally different. And so um, the reason why people are uh, being vegan today is because it's much more than nutrition. It's an identity, okay? And, it's, and what's really driving it is uh, climate change and animal welfare. These are much, much more powerful motivators than uh, nutrition, which actually means, uh, there are studies that try to encourage people to eat less meat. Instead of telling you meat is bad for you, you know, all this barbecue, uh, all of this stuff is bad, they tell you about no harm to animal or saving the planet. And you'll see people who are diehard meat lovers much more likely to change. And indirectly, you've achieved your goal. It's called stealth marketing. You know, you, you talk about A, when what you want is really B, but because they're both leading to the same outcome, now, what's fascinating to me is that even though those uh, nutrition labeling scores have very limited impact on demand, on consumers, they have a huge impact on supply on the uh, companies. And whenever I'm involved in those talks, you see them running scared, really, really scared, and saying, um, how do we improve our nutritional profile 
So we move from a C to a B or from a B to a B. And um, I think some companies have the food scientists that can do that. You can actually buy today Skir from uh, you know, Danone, for example. That's Nutri-Score A, uh, even though it's actually really thick and uh, it's not just water. And you can also find, uh, you know, Halo Pop ice cream. It's basically water, and, uh, but it tastes good. And it's half the calories, so it became the number one brand in ice cream. So there are times when you can uh, reformulate your way. But in general, I think reformulation is not uh, the solution we think it is. And the reason is the following. So when I was, uh, for example, visiting at, at Harvard, I gave a talk at the Harvard School of Public Health and the um, chair of the department of nutrition came to me and asked me a very simple question. He said, why can't the food industry just sell healthier food? Why do they also always sell these uh, um, sodas, for example, that have zero nutritional value? And in fact, he said, why do anyone buy soda? Right? Oh, Coke, I see Coke here. And I, I said, this is tasty and it makes you look cool. And your know, doctors don't understand that. It's so simple. They really think that um, people uh, should naturally be um, uh, attracted to healthy food because they're better, they're more nutritious. And I, 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 I ask this question a lot because I'm a marketing professor and, and, and I, I found that there's something that many of these people have in common. All these people think it's easy that PepsiCo only needs to sell more broccoli instead of uh, chips, etc. They have one thing in common, which is that they are all childless. Because as soon as you have children, you realize that it's not so easy to make them love healthy food. And if you don't believe me, I have this video here, which is a hidden camera of uh, kids who are uh, tr were trying to. Um, sell to them healthy Halloween treats. Who likes Halloween candy? Me! Well, we're gonna replace candy with some healthy Halloween treats today. These are called veggie fruit chews, guys. This is the most worst I ever tasted. It's not good. Mine tastes like broccoli. Yes, mine tastes like poop poop. Kind of good, kind of bad. Be honest with me, Adriana. It's bad. We have asparagus <laughs> flavor, beet flavor, vitamin A and D. Hey, you're saying disgusting stuff is good stuff, and it's disgusting. You're gonna love <laughs> these healthy nori pops. Nori pops? It also has a fibrous quality, which is gonna get your colon going in the morning. They're disgusting. These are tofu <laughs> ghost mellows. Uh, it tastes like rotten dough. What about artichoke buttercups? <laughs> I threw up. You threw up? Okay. <laughs> They're delicious, healthy cupcakes. It tastes like poopy pinata. Kind of riboflavin. B12. B12 is like the best treat you can get on Halloween. It's like the worst thing I've ever tasted. I think I need water. These are the treats that are replacing candy on Halloween. How do you like Halloween without candy? <laughs> I want candy! <laughs> this is the the Shondo family when I try to restrict Nutella. You know? <laughs> so yeah, it's really hard. You know, infants, even you know, a few hours uh, old infant, smiles when they taste sweet and have make a frown when you make them taste something that's bitter. Like like uh, so. It's really, really uh, taste is number one, and you cannot compromise on taste if you're in the food business. Yes. Is there any studies that show whether this changes if the child from an early age has been exposed to healthy flavors? Yeah, you can train your kid if you're really, really strong will parents and if your kid lives in a bubble. Uh, but as soon as they will go to a um, party and, yeah. and taste sweets, you know, it'll be the end of it. And that's why parents in the US, you know, they, they, they really, really, really uh, warn everyone not to give candies uh, to birthday parties. Uh, but, you know, at some point it will happen. So yes, you can at some level, but it's gonna be really, really hard. And uh, I think we just need to really recognize that, you know, this is just, uh, we are intrinsically um, motivated to uh, seek calories, okay? Because uh, that's what we need to function as bodies. You know, we've been, uh, as a species, uh, you know, there was been some Darwinian selection on exactly that point. So this is problem number one. If you reformulate and it doesn't taste good, no one will buy it. Yes. 
Yeah, I don't know when you want to take this question, but it's regarding the frequency and the time at which you eat, uh, which I believe impacts a lot obesity and like uh, putting on weight. Absolutely. And uh, maybe even more than actually the Nutri score, because if you eat two A's compared to one D, that may be actually worse than eating one D. Do we explain? This is exactly what I wanted to say. Okay, yeah. Because a lot of the focus is on what to eat. We reformulate, we improve the food, and I agree totally with you that the answer is not necessarily to change what we eat, but to change how much and maybe how often we eat it. And I think that um, the, um, we are protected, for example, in France from a lot of these uh, marketing uh, influences because we still have this very rigid ideas about when to eat. To give you an anecdote, when I was a PhD student at, at Wharton, I am. Um, we used to uh, reward study participants with pizza. And uh, I remember telling my, my advisor, oh, Brian, we have a problem because you know, the study is at 10 a.m. And it was like, and? And we're giving them pizza. And? <laughs> Brian, pizza at 10 a.m.? He was like, I don't understand. <laughs> and you know, he was right. I was shocked to realize that in the US, people will eat pizza no matter when. It's 10 a.m., it's 3 p.m., it's 5 a.m. You have kids for birthday party, first thing you give them is pizza. Then cupcakes, then a cake they never touch, okay? It's just pretty colors. No, so I think if you look at, I, don't, I have it somewhere, I can find it. When people are actually eating, if this is 12 noon, and this is the U.S., okay? Uh, you see it's a little bit like that. If you look at when people are eating in France, it's like that. Mm -hmm. So this is when you want to attack the country, okay? Because everyone is eating between 12.30 and 1.30. Uh, and uh, those very strong rules <laughs> about when to eat, they protect us. Because instead of making 20 decisions a day, 20 snack decisions, 20 opportunities to get it wrong, you're constrained because c'est comme ça, okay? You eat this, before that, voila, okay? And, um, and there are these very strong rules that sometimes make no sense, that every traditional society has, made often they're also religious, et cetera, that you go to a country of immigrants like the US, people lost totally their food cultures, and then people are lost because they don't know what, when to eat, or it's all what to eat and how much. And, um, and I think this is a, a really, really important. Um, so thank you for that question. But uh, finishing on why it's not enough to uh, reformulate the food is what I call the health halo effect. So the health halo effect is something that I've studied and um, where I was looking at what happens after you have reformulated the food and you made it healthier. So it used to be low fat, now it's low sugar. And so we did a study where we went and we had those M&Ms. You know, you can actually go on M&Ms.com and print stuff like, I love you, happy yeah. birthday. Now being a marketing professor, we printed on them low fat or light M&Ms, which do not exist, okay? So basically lie to people, you know, but we're marketing professor for research, so you know, it's okay, I guess. So we, we wrote light, allégé, France, US, no difference. And um, we did a study and then French TV interviewed me, so we, we, we replicated the study for television. Pierre Chandon propose à la moitié des volontaires de prendre des bonbons classiques. La plupart choisissent de petites quantités. L'autre moitié doit piocher dans le saladier allégé. Et là, il se lâche. I never thought people would take the, the entire cup and then dunk it into the bowl. Okay? And you know why? Because people said, oh, it's healthy, I can eat more. And so when they were called regular, people served themselves in a real study, not the one on TV. 192 calories. They thought they had served themselves half, that's a different topic. When uh, they were called low fat, the overweight uh, population in our sample uh, took 46% more, but then they thought that they had uh, consumed the same amount of calories. When in reality, if you're low fat, you're just low in fat, you're not low in calories. And so what happens is here is people think it's healthy, they can eat more. And so it's a problem if you remove the salt from the soup and people add more salt themselves, you haven't really made any progress. Question. I have a question regarding the participants in this study. Were they skeptical uh, and kind of like asking questions in regards to 
how much of a difference the low fat was to the regular? No, and that's, uh, you know, you give people m and free M&Ms, you can try it. They won't ask many questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the, um, I think if it were done now, so this was done 20 years ago when low fat was a big thing. Um, today, I would try with, you know, uh, maybe and process would be kind of hard to do here, but low sugar or gluten-free, you know, in general, if you are healthy on one dimension, this health halo uh, phenomenon is that people think you're healthy on all the other dimensions. So if you're low in fat, they think you're low in calorie, low in sugar, and also local, and you treat your employees well. You know, this halo effect. And uh, it's a big problem for the food industry because they're working really hard to remove salt, sugar, and fat. And then if consumers consume more of it, no one is making a lot of progress. Uh, the last uh, demonstration of this health halo effect, this is not one of my studies, I wish it was, but um, they asked people, how many calories on the cheeseburger? People said 600, which is way too many. That's the opposite of health halo, it's a health horn, you know? Oh, cheeseburger bad, it must be 600 calories. No, it's a lot less than that. Anyway, how many calories in a side salad? People underestimated, they said 89. Here's an interesting one. They were asked, how many calories in the combo? Another group, okay? Burger and salad, what do you think happened? Thousands. They went down. It went down, in fact, so much that people thought the combo had fewer calories than the burger alone. <laughs> so it's as if you're adding the salad and it magically sucks up the calories of the burger. Magic, negative calories, you know, you should trademark that. And what's going on here? It's again, I think, because we tend to focus, like, like our friend said, too much on what we eat and not enough on how much. We can understand the idea. People say, okay, cheeseburger, bad, salad, good. So it averages out. Unfortunately, calories only add, they never average out. <laughs> if you add a salad to every one of your meals, you're not gonna lose any weight, okay? So this, uh, and I think this phenomenon here, you can see a lot, why do they add the stupid cherry on the cake? I hate it, you know? It's, why do they add the salad next to the entrecote in, even if the salad has been there since, you know, um, uh, François Hollande was president. <laughs> because it just on average balances out. And, and but unfortunately, it does, does not high work. So to summarize, um, what I think we need to do, we need to move from food reformulation, changing what we eat to in, improving how we eat. And here's where Epicurus again reminds us that the wise person doesn't choose the largest amount of food, but the most pleasing. And so quantity, I think, is, is a solution. And it's one of the few solutions that I argue is a win-win between the industry for food, industry, for, for business, health, and pleasure. So if you move from cognitive nudges to affective nudges, my, my favorite ones, and it's very basic, is selling healthy food as if it was junk food, not on nutrition, on pleasure. A great study done in uh, half a dozen US cafeterias. They try to uh, get people like you to eat more vegetables. In one condition, they uh, provided nutrition information. They said those green beans are nutritious. Or they said those carrots, they have lots of antioxidants. The result was a 21% reduction, <laughs> reduction in the percentage of people who chose the veggie. Why? Because people think, oh, if it's healthy, it must be disgusting. <laughs> okay, uh, and again, because people don't want health, they want taste. So what did they do? It was very simple. The same exact same green beans were rebranded as sizzling Sichuan green beans, and all of a sudden, plus fourteen percent. Dynamite beans, blah blah blah. You use you, you said you my grandmother's own recipe. You use a. Uh, uh, geographic uh, markers, you say from Provence, uh, blah, you know, and, and all of that, wow, it's going to be tasty. And then uh, there's so much placebo effect in food. We have this colleague, Hilke Plasman, she gave people wine to drink in the uh, fMRI scanner. Same wine, when people thought it was expensive wine, the areas of the brain that measure pleasure, they went berserk, showing that people don't lie when they say they prefer the expensive wine. It's all expectation driven. If you think it tastes good, within reason, it tastes good. 
I've done these studies with in the lab in Paris with um, Red Bull and vodka. Rings a bell? <laughs> we had people drink the same cocktail of vodka, Red Bull, and fruit juice. But in one condition, we told them this is a cocktail of fruit juice and vodka. Everyone could tell there was vodka anyway. In the other condition, we said this is a cocktail of fruit juice, vodka, and Red Bull. Same, this drank the same thing. When they knew there was Red Bull in it, they were like, oh my God, I, I need to sit down. You know, I'm so hyped. And we, it was such a fun study. These were all guys. We showed them photos of women. And we said, imagine you meet them in the bar. You know, uh, who would you talk to? And these guys, their ego was through the roof. They were like, I'm going to talk to the preacher's one. And for sure, it's going to, she will give me her number, etc." So it was crazy how, again, just a, a, the expectation, the placebo effect drives so much. The good thing about focusing on the pleasure of food is that not only you can sell healthier food, but you can also make people choose more reasonable portions. So one hidden secret is that pleasure in food does not increase with quantity. This is something really important because when we have to choose between small, medium, and large dessert, let's say chocolate, ice cream, et cetera, we tend to choose the big one because we're afraid we'll be hungry, maybe, and also because it's better value for money. I mean, when you, you remember the movie theaters in the old days, you have this popcorn bucket, they cost nothing. And when you buy the small one, you feel like you know, you're getting ripped off. So there are many reasons why we choose the big one. But what we fail to remember is that from a pure pleasure point of view, it's the other one. The first bite, the first gulp, is the one that gives us the highest pleasure. The first uh, chocolate mousse uh, spoonful is the one like, like, wow. The second one is still pleasurable, but a bit less than the first. The last one, when you have a big portion, honestly, doesn't taste great or it's a bit too much. So this is a, a really very important phenomenon called hedonic adaptation. The last bite, or blend, or mildly unpalatable. But here's the other very important secret. And this is really the key here. The overall pleasure of eating that chocolate mousse is not the sum of the pleasure from each bite, but the average. Which means that those final bites here that are not really tasty. They don't add a little bit of nothing. They actually draw the average down, which is why you always end up regretting them. Isn't it true? The last spoonful of chocolate mousse, always regret it. You wish you had stopped earlier. It's like, ah, too much. So this is a universal truth that we neglect because we're focused so much on hunger, cessation, value for money. So Epicurean marketing, for example, is how do we increase the importance of pleasure when people make uh, quantity decisions? And I'll show you how we do that. Yes. There's a side benefit that sort of ties in from the last slide where if you tell someone that something is full of calories and really um, like decadent, they actually feel more satiated after they eat it. So by marketing vegetables and things as not necessarily focusing on the nutrition, but focusing on other attributes, you may also, when they're eating, have them feel more satisfied from the meal. You there. may. Uh, satiation is a harder thing to um, manipulate than pure taste mm -hmm. because you can feel if your stomach is full or not. But there's some studies that have tried that. I have tried it myself. I haven't been really successful, though. Okay. Uh, it's easier to, uh, to manipulate this. I know that it's, uh, we're running out of time. I'll just show you this study, okay? Uh, not this one, that's too much. This is a study we run in a real restaurant with real consumers. They could choose as many as they wanted of uh, entree, uh, sorry, appetizer, main course, and dessert. And we had three menus, either basic menus or menus with... Um, the sensory description of the food. It's even better in French. Bœuf subtilement relevé au piment d'Espelette, blah, 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 blah. It was, I can tell you now, it was actually uh, Picard food because it was 15 euros, what do you expect, you know, in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. There was basic food, but described with multi-sensory, the textures, the, you know, the aromas, blah, blah, blah. Or we had a condition where the food was just described as in the control condition, but we had information about calories and fat. Here's what happened. In a control condition, people serve themselves, it's like all you can order, about a thousand calories. And at the end of the meal, they said it's worth 17 euros. 
in the sensory condition with this Epicurean menu focusing on pleasure, people serve themselves 17% less food. And yet they thought the, old, the overall experience was worth more money, 20, it was worth $20. So we found a way to make people happier with less food. Why? Because we just used the trick that the uh, high-end restaurants have used all along, which is to make you in the mood to savor food. What we find is when people had the menu describing the food as something je ne sais quoi, they stopped looking at their phone, they ate more slowly, more mindfully, they savored. And in the end, they actually got more pleasure out of it. In contrast, with the nutrition menu, we had a 30% reduction in the amount uh, that people ate because people in France are not used to seeing calories on the menu, which is too much, it's unsustainable. I bet many of them stopped at McDonald's on the way home for a Sunday because you know it's not enough for a meal, 600 calories. And they hated it because it, it, was, a cal it was a hedonic bomb that destroyed all the pleasure. I have lots of other things to tell you about how you can reduce portion sizes without people showing, but I think we're out of time. Yeah. So I'm just going to uh, finish with some, um, there are a couple of slides. Uh, all of this is, by the way, available on my website. There's a TED, TEDx talk you can watch where you can see me having fun with big portions. Um, and so uh, uh, I will probably stand going to stop in time. And um, thank you, everyone. everyone. Um, Jean, Luca, yeah. if there's anything you want to add, I, I, I need to show this. Yeah, yeah. And thank you. Yeah, and this one here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Afterwards, that people have. To I'm happy to stay. Those to stay. who need to go can go. Anyone yeah. else wants to stay? Yeah. Uh, happy to. Uh, it's fine in the dark. Uh, yes. Anyone? Don't, don't ask me about that. Well. Uh, There's a few um, different announcements we want to make. As you guys know, this is the second day of the Health, health Week. And then, um, so maybe, how do we do this? If you go left, click on the left. Yeah. First of all, so I have to make a shout out to uh, Peak Punk. So these are protein bars, which I had one of these yesterday. They're very good. So they're going to be our sponsor of the health week. So we want to definitely do a shout out for them. If you actually want to log on to find more information, you can do so with the QR code there. Uh, the other thing that's happening today is the spa and the dark. And I hope tomorrow. I'm getting tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yes. Right. Spa and the dark. So this side is really, really interesting. So basically what's happening is that you will get a massage in the dark from people who are blind. And so both participant and receiver will be blind and you'll be doing the spa in the dark. So it's a way of raising awareness for the visually impaired. So that's actually on the agenda as well. Uh, and then today, again, for the second event, um, second day, it's going to be mindfulness this afternoon at five in Amphi and boxing is at seven, okay? And so, as I said, this is the rest of the week as it stands now. Yesterday was a great day. So thank you guys so much. That was really, really cool. And I think today was, again, fantastic. I want to definitely give you another round of applause. Today. Thank you. Thank you. And then tomorrow we're going to have, uh, it's uh, Fabrice Leclerc, who's going to be talking about how nature can help us regenerate. So this has been a fantastic event. Thank you guys very, 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 very much for coming. And uh, we're going to stick around for a few more questions. After. Absolutely. Thanks again. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.